everyone, let's go back in time together and learn something new. Chapter 1, Introduction to the Crusades The Crusades, a complex and multi-layered series of military campaigns, loom large in the history of the Middle Ages. They commenced at the end of the 11th century, a time marked by profound societal changes, expanding economies, and escalating religious fervor in Europe. Rooted in religious belief and political ambition, these expeditions left an indelible impact on Christian and Muslim relations, shaping the socio-political landscape of vast regions and shaping the course of history. When we delve into the etymology of the term crusade, we uncover its origins in the Latin word cruciata, which derives from crux or cross. The crusaders, known as cruces inati or those signed by the cross, undertook these missions under the sign of the cross, affirming their commitment to a holy endeavor. However, the usage of the term Crusades to denote these specific military campaigns did not come into being until the 17th century. Before then, contemporaries would often refer to them as pilgrimages or journeys, reinforcing their sacred connotations. The genesis of the Crusades lies in the developments that unraveled in the Middle East. The Byzantine Empire, a bastion of Christianity in the East and the successor state to the Roman Empire, faced grave threats from the Seljuk Turks. The Seljuks, adherents of Sunni Islam, had steadily expanded their territories, culminating in their victory over the Byzantines at the Battle of Manzikert in 1071. Consequently, the Byzantine Emperor Alexios I Komnenos, seeking to repel the Seljuk advance, sent envoys to Pope Urban II in 1095, requesting military assistance. This plea would set the wheels in motion for the First Crusade. Pope Urban II's response came in the form of a sermon delivered at the Council of Clermont, France, in November 1095. His speech ignited the religious and martial zeal of his audience. He painted vivid, distressing images of Christian suffering in the East and appealed to the knights and nobles of Western Europe to lay aside their differences and launch a holy war against the Muslims. The immediate objective was to aid the embattled Byzantine Empire. Still, as the Crusaders' mission grew in scope, the recapture of Jerusalem, the city central to Christian faith, emerged as the ultimate goal. The response to Urban's call was extraordinary. The First Crusade was not an organized military campaign led by kings, as later ones would be. Instead, it was a popular movement comprising groups of knights, clerics, peasants, and others, all spurred by religious conviction, a desire for adventure, or the allure of potential wealth. The first wave, known as the People's Crusade, set off in early 1096, ill-prepared and ill-disciplined, and ended in disaster. A second, more organized wave followed, consisting mainly of knights and their retinues. This second wave of crusaders, after grueling marches and fierce battles, achieved what had once seemed impossible, the capture of Jerusalem in 1099. Despite the widespread violence and loss of life, the crusaders viewed their victory as divinely ordained, reaffirming their belief in their holy mission. Thus, the crusades began, a holy war that would span centuries, involving scores of kingdoms and peoples, and reverberate through history. These campaigns would shape the religious and political dynamics of Europe and the Middle East, altering the trajectory of history. However, it is essential to remember that the Crusades were not monolithic events but multifaceted processes marked by varying motives, successes, failures, and impacts, which we shall explore in the forthcoming chapters. Chapter 2 – The Call to Arms The Council of Clermont, convened in November 1095, is a significant milestone in the history of the Crusades. It was at this assembly that Pope Urban II, the spiritual leader of Western Christendom, delivered an impassioned plea that ignited the fires of the First Crusade. The historical significance of this sermon resides not only in the direct consequences of his appeal but also in the socio-political and religious climate it reflects. Pope Urban II's sermon at Clermont was, in essence, a call to arms, a summons for the nobility and knights of Western Europe to rally in a holy war against the Muslim forces threatening the Byzantine Empire. The text of the sermon, not preserved in its entirety, has been pieced together from several contemporary accounts, each with its interpretations and embellishments. This lack of a definitive version does not diminish the sermon's potency or the intensity of the response it elicited. Urban's appeal was a potent cocktail of vivid imagery, impassioned rhetoric, and an acute understanding of the contemporary context. The suffering of the Christians in the East, subjected to the Seljuk Turks rule, was central to his narrative. He described in graphic detail the alleged atrocities committed by the Muslims, accentuating the desecration of Christian holy places, and the torment inflicted on the Christian populace. These narratives, though likely exaggerated, struck a chord with his audience, sparking outrage and inflaming their religious zeal. Yet, Urban's plea was not merely a call for spiritual retribution. 
It was also a means to channel the aggressive tendencies of the Western nobility, who were often embroiled in violent disputes amongst themselves. By focusing their energies towards a holy cause in the East, Urban sought to bring about a semblance of peace within Western Christendom, thereby strengthening the Church's authority and control. More subtly, Urban II played upon the age-old concept of pilgrimage, imbuing it with militant overtones. The journey to the Holy Land was not an unfamiliar concept to the Christian audience, but Urban melted it with the idea of a righteous war, of taking the cross, thus transforming the act of pilgrimage into a martial endeavor for the Christian faith. This spiritual dimension, complemented by promises of heavenly reward and remission of sins, was a powerful motivator that played a crucial role in mobilizing people of all strata of society for the crusade. At the end of his speech, Urban II received an enthusiastic response. Shouts of Deus Volt, God wills it, echoed through the crowd, symbolizing their acceptance of the cause. The Pope's words set in motion a wave of crusading enthusiasm that swept across Western Europe, resulting in a massive popular movement unprecedented in scale and scope. The Sermon at Claremont was not just an isolated religious event, it was a catalyst, setting the stage for a series of conflicts that would last for centuries. It was a strategic appeal designed to unite the fractious Western Christian nobility under a common religious banner and provide aid to the beleaguered Byzantine Empire. Simultaneously, it was a reflection of the prevailing religious sentiment, the rise of militant Christianity, and the changing dynamics of power in the medieval world. Its impact and ramifications would reverberate throughout the following centuries, forever changing the course of European and Middle Eastern history. Chapter 3 the First Crusade, 1096-1099 The First Crusade, which took place from 1096-1099, to was a pivotal event in the history of medieval Europe and the Middle East. The Crusade, an extraordinary example of mass mobilization across the continent, was marked by intense religious fervor, a blend of spiritual and secular motivations, and a series of bloody military campaigns that would profoundly alter the course of history. The spark for this unprecedented movement was lit by Pope Urban II's impassioned plea at the Council of Clermont in 1095. His call to arms was met with enthusiastic response from all social strata, from the nobility and knighthood to the commoners. The promise of spiritual rewards, the possibility of acquiring wealth and land, and the inherent adventure of the journey appealed to a wide range of individuals. The initial wave of the First Crusade, known as the People's Crusade, was a grassroots movement largely composed of commoners. Led by charismatic preachers like Peter the Hermit, this motley crowd of peasants, artisans, and minor knights, armed more with religious zeal than military prowess, embarked on the long journey to the Holy Land in early 1096. Tragically, the People's Crusade, for all its enthusiasm, was ill-prepared for such a daunting task. Its participants, lacking adequate supplies, military discipline, and understanding of the terrain and local cultures, soon faced catastrophic setbacks. They clashed with local communities along the way, leading to plunder and violence, and upon reaching Asia Minor, were swiftly and brutally defeated by the Seljuk Turks. While the People's Crusade ended in disaster, it was the subsequent wave of the First Crusade, marked by greater organization and leadership, that would ultimately shape history. Unlike the People's Crusade, this second wave was led by prominent figures of the European nobility. This included leaders like Godfrey of Bouillon, Raymond of Toulouse, Bohemond of Taranto, and others, who commanded contingents of professional soldiers and military resources. These crusaders faced immense challenges, grueling marches across hundreds of miles, the harsh climate, unfamiliar territory, and hostile forces. Despite these hardships, the crusaders made significant gains, capturing key cities such as Nicaea, Antioch, and, ultimately, Jerusalem. The capture of Jerusalem in July 1099, following a brutal siege and subsequent massacre of its inhabitants, was perceived as a triumphant validation of their holy mission. Jerusalem, the spiritual heart of the Christian faith, was once again in Christian hands after centuries of Muslim rule. The success of the First Crusade was a momentous event that stunned both the Christian and Muslim worlds. The scale of the mobilization, the determination of the Crusaders, and the ultimate achievement of their goals set a powerful precedent. The First Crusade not only reshaped the religious, political, and cultural landscape of Europe and the Middle East but also left a legacy that would inspire future Crusades in the following centuries. From this tumultuous period of faith, violence, ambition, and struggle emerged the enduring saga of the Crusades, indelibly inscribed in the annals of history. Chapter 4, The Establishment of Crusader States The triumph of the First Crusade in 1099, which culminated in the capture of Jerusalem, marked not merely the end of a military campaign, but also the beginning of a new political and cultural project in the Levant, 
the establishment of Latin Christian states, known collectively as the Crusader states, or Utreme, from the French Utreme, meaning beyond the sea. These nascent political entities, namely the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the County of Edessa, the Principality of Antioch, and the County of Tripoli, represented an attempt by the Western Christian invaders to establish and maintain control over the captured territories. The formation and existence of these Crusader states hold critical importance in understanding the long-term impacts and implications of the Crusades. The Kingdom of Jerusalem, considered the most significant of these states, was founded in 1099 following the Crusaders' seizure of the city. It emerged as a feudal state modeled largely after those in Western Europe, albeit with modifications to adapt to its unique geopolitical situation. Godfrey of Bouillon, one of the leaders of the First Crusade, was the first ruler, refusing the title of king and choosing instead to be known as the defender of the Holy Sepulchre. Upon his death, his brother Baldwin I took the throne, becoming the first to take the title of King of Jerusalem. The kingdom, at its height, extended from Beirut in the north to the Red Sea in the south and encompassed key cities like Acre and Jaffa. To the north of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, two other crusader states were established, the County of Edessa and the Principality of Antioch. The County of Edessa, founded in 1098 by Baldwin of Boulogne, was the first of the crusader states. Despite its geographical separation from the other states and its vulnerability to Muslim counterattacks, Edessa held strategic importance as a buffer state. The Principality of Antioch, founded by Bohemond of Taranto in the same year, was another crucial state. Controlling the city of Antioch allowed the Crusaders to command a significant route to the Mediterranean, further consolidating their power in the region. Lastly, the County of Tripoli, established in 1109, was the final addition to the network of Crusader states. Located between the Principality of Antioch and the Kingdom of Jerusalem, its creation filled a critical gap in the Crusader-held territory along the eastern Mediterranean coast. The establishment of these Crusader states represented an ambitious attempt to transplant Western feudal systems and Latin Christian control into a predominantly Muslim region with a complex ethnic and religious tapestry. Despite their successful establishment and early expansion, these states were surrounded by potentially hostile powers, requiring constant vigilance and defense. Moreover, they necessitated the establishment of a Latin Christian society in a region geographically distant and culturally different from Western Europe, posing substantial administrative, social, and economic challenges. These challenges, along with the state's survival, interaction with neighboring societies, and eventual decline, provide a fascinating lens through which to explore the broader crusading endeavor's complexities and contradictions. Chapter 5, The Second Crusade, 1147-1149 the Second Crusade, which spanned from 1147 to 1149, was the next major crusading expedition following the triumph of the First Crusade. Unlike its predecessor, however, this crusade, despite being a royal endeavor endorsed by the papacy and led by two of the most powerful monarchs of Europe, was marred by a series of misfortunes and ultimately ended in failure. The trigger for the Second Crusade was the fall of the County of Edessa in 1144, the first of the Crusader states, to the Muslim general Zengi, the Atabeg of Mosul. The loss of Edessa sent shockwaves through Christian Europe. Pope Eugene III responded by issuing the papal bull quantum predecessors in December 1145, calling for a new expedition to the Holy Land. This was the first time a crusade had been called in response to a military setback, setting a precedent for future crusades. The leadership of the Second Crusade was taken up by two European monarchs, Louis VII of France and Conrad III of Germany, marking the first time that reigning kings led a crusade. This royal leadership was in stark contrast to the First Crusade, which was spearheaded primarily by lesser nobility. The active involvement of such influential rulers signaled the increasing significance and scale of the crusading movement. Despite the high profile of its leaders, the Second Crusade was beset by problems from the outset. Differences in strategy, culture, and language led to tensions between the French and German contingents, which were further exacerbated by the Byzantine Empire's perceived lack of support. The Crusaders' march across Asia Minor was fraught with difficulties, culminating in a disastrous defeat by the Seljuks near Doralium in October 1147. The surviving Crusaders limped on to Antioch, but their strength and morale were severely depleted. In 1148, the Crusader leaders convened at the Council of Acre to decide on their next move. After much deliberation, they elected to launch an attack on the city of Damascus, a former ally of the Crusader states. The siege of Damascus, however, proved disastrous. Divisions among the Crusader leadership, coupled with a robust defense by the Damascenes, led to a swift and humiliating failure. The Crusaders were forced to retreat after only four days, marking a disheartening end to their expedition. 
the failure of the Second Crusade had far-reaching implications. The unsuccessful siege of Damascus alienated a potential ally and strengthened the resolve of the Muslim powers in Syria. Furthermore, the defeat dealt a severe blow to the prestige of the papacy and the crusading ideal, leading to a sense of disillusionment and cynicism in Europe. The fallout from the Second Crusade set the stage for further Muslim consolidation and the eventual launch of the Third Crusade. Chapter 6, The Fall of Jerusalem and the Third Crusade, 1187-1192 the fall of Jerusalem in 1187 to the Muslim leader Saladin was a shocking blow to Christendom. This pivotal event marked the end of almost a century of Christian rule and served as the catalyst for the Third Crusade. This crusade, also known as the King's Crusade, was notable for its illustrious leadership by three of Europe's most significant rulers, Richard I the Lionheart of England, Philip II of France, and Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa of the Holy Roman Empire. In the years leading up to 1187, Saladin, the Sultan of Egypt and Syria, had successfully unified much of the Muslim Near East under his rule. His ultimate victory came in July 1187, at the Battle of Hattin, where he inflicted a catastrophic defeat on the forces of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. The road to Jerusalem lay open, and by October, Saladin had retaken the Holy City. The loss of Jerusalem, the heart of Christendom in the East, sent tremors through the Christian world and led Pope Gregory VIII to issue the papal bull Audita Tremendi, calling for a new crusade. The Third Crusade, 1189-1192, more so than any previous crusade, was dominated by the commanding presence of Europe's leading monarchs. Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa, a veteran of the Second Crusade, was the first to take up the cross, leading a massive army through the Byzantine Empire and into Asia Minor. However, his untimely death in 1190 during a river crossing in Cilicia dealt a severe blow to the crusade. Meanwhile, King Richard I of England and King Philip II of France, two of the era's most potent rivals, had also mobilized their forces. They took the sea route, arriving separately in the Holy Land in 1191. Despite their fraught relationship and differing strategic visions, Richard and Philip successfully besieged the port city of Acre, a crucial victory that allowed them to establish a foothold for their operations. However, shortly after this success, Philip chose to return to France, leaving Richard as the undisputed leader of the crusade. King Richard, known for his martial prowess, launched a series of campaigns against Saladin's forces. He achieved significant victories, notably at the Battle of Arsif, and managed to recapture several coastal cities, significantly improving the position of the crusader states. However, Jerusalem remained tantalizingly out of reach. Despite coming within sight of the Holy City, Richard ultimately decided against a direct assault, fearing that even if taken, Jerusalem could not be held given the existing resources. With both sides exhausted and recognizing their respective strengths and limitations, Richard and Saladin agreed to the Treaty of Ramla in 1192. This treaty ended hostilities and allowed Christian pilgrims unarmed access to Jerusalem's holy sites, even as the city itself remained under Muslim control. Thus, the Third Crusade concluded not with a decisive military victory but with a negotiated settlement, reflecting the complex interplay of military, political, and religious factors that characterized this phase of the Crusades. Chapter 7, The Fourth Crusade, 1202-1204, and the Sack of Constantinople. The Fourth Crusade, spanning from 1202 to 1204, is one of the most remarkable and contentious episodes in the history of the Crusades. While initially intended to retake Jerusalem, which remained under Muslim control, this crusade, in an astonishing divergence from its original path, ended up besieging and sacking Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire. This event, a dramatic embodiment of the volatile mix of religious zeal, political ambition, and economic motivation that characterized the Crusades, dealt a severe blow to the Byzantine Empire and has since cast a long shadow over the legacy of the Crusading movement. The groundwork for the Fourth Crusade was laid by Pope Innocent III, who ascended to the papacy in 1198. Driven by a desire to restore Jerusalem to Christian control and to mend the schism between the Western and Eastern churches, Innocent called for a new crusade. He envisaged an ambitious plan to bypass the well-defended territories in the Levant and instead invade Egypt, which was viewed as the heart of Muslim power in the region. To carry out this plan, 
the Crusaders turned to the Maritime Republic of Venice for naval transportation. However, the Crusaders could not meet the payment for the Venetian fleet, leading to a controversial and fateful deal. In return for a delay in payment, the Crusaders would assist Venice in capturing the Christian city of Zara on the Dalmatian coast, which had rebelled against Venetian rule. The siege of Zara in late 1202 was a success, but it sparked outrage across Europe. Pope Innocent III, who had expressly forbidden any attacks on Christian cities, excommunicated the Crusaders and the Venetians. However, the Crusade did not stop there. The Crusaders became entangled in Byzantine politics when they agreed to support a claimant to the Byzantine throne, Alexios Angelos, who promised generous rewards and military support for the Crusade to Egypt. In July 1203, the Crusaders and their Venetian allies launched an assault on Constantinople. After a series of confrontations, they managed to place Alexios on the throne as Alexios IV. However, his reign was short-lived. He was unable to deliver on his lavish promises, leading to his overthrow and murder in a palace coup in early 1204. Faced with this turn of events, the Crusaders, driven by a mix of outrage, desperation, and greed, decided to take the city for themselves. In April 1204, they launched a massive assault on Constantinople. The city, the greatest in Christendom, fell to the Crusaders after a fierce battle. What followed was a horrific sack that lasted for three days. Churches and monasteries were looted, ancient and sacred relics were desecrated or stolen, and citizens were subjected to horrendous atrocities. The Crusaders not only claimed a vast amount of booty but also established the Latin Empire of Constantinople, which lasted until 1261. The sack of Constantinople represented a tragic and dramatic divergence from the Crusades' original objectives. It caused irreversible damage to the Byzantine Empire, which was already in decline, and deeply widened the schism between the Eastern Orthodox and Western Roman Catholic churches. Moreover, it irreparably tarnished the image of the Crusades, transforming them in the eyes of many from a noble, if flawed, religious endeavor into a symbol of brutal and rapacious greed. The Fourth Crusade stands as a stark testament to the unpredictable trajectories of historical events and the profound impacts these can have on the course of civilizations and cultures. Chapter 8, The Later Crusades In the wake of the Fourth Crusade and the infamous sack of Constantinople, the crusading movement entered a new phase. The subsequent Crusades, from the 5th to the 9th, were marked by shifting objectives, changing alliances, and a widening scope that went beyond the original goal of reclaiming the Holy Land from Muslim control. This period also saw the launch of several distinct yet related campaigns, such as the Albigensian Crusade and the Children's Crusade, which further stretched the boundaries of what could be considered a crusade. The Fifth Crusade, 1217-1221, was an attempt to recapture Jerusalem by invading Egypt, similar to the initial plan of the Fourth Crusade. However, Despite initial successes in capturing Damietta, the crusade ended in failure due to tactical mistakes and lack of coordination among the crusaders. The Sixth Crusade, 1228-1229, led by Emperor Frederick II of the Holy Roman Empire, took a diplomatic route. Through negotiations, Frederick managed to regain control of several sites in the Holy Land, including Jerusalem, albeit without its fortifications. The Seventh Crusade, 1248 to 1254, led by King Louis IX of France, again targeted Egypt. This crusade, one of the best organized, was marked by Louis's deep piety and his desire to fulfill his crusading vow. However, after an initial victory at Damietta, the crusade met a disastrous defeat at the Battle of Al Mansura, and Louis was taken captive. The 8th, 1270, and 9th Crusades, 1271 to 1272 while less defined, were also centered around the figure of Louis IX. The Eighth Crusade ended abruptly with Louis's death outside Tunis, and the Ninth, led by Prince Edward of England, achieved little lasting success. In addition to these major crusades, this period also saw other campaigns branded as crusades but directed towards targets other than the Muslim powers in the East. The Albigensian Crusade, 1209-1229, initiated by Pope Innocent III, was waged against the Cathars, a heretical Christian sect in southern France. This brutal and violent campaign was aimed at wiping out the Cathars and bringing the region firmly under the control of the French crown and the Catholic Church. 
The Children's Crusade of 1212, more a popular movement than a formal crusade, was another extraordinary episode. This crusade, led according to chronicles by a French shepherd boy named Stephen and a German boy named Nicholas, involved thousands of children, adolescents, and adults marching towards the Holy Land to peacefully convert Muslims. Most never reached their destination, and many were reportedly sold into slavery, marking this crusade as one of the most tragic events in the history of the crusading movement. Furthermore, the concept of crusading was applied in other contexts, including campaigns against the Moors in Spain, the pagans in the Baltic region, and political opponents of the papacy in Italy. These crusades demonstrated the adaptability and expansiveness of the crusading idea, while also revealing the complex interplay of religious, political, and socio-economic factors that underpin these campaigns. Thus, the later crusades, though largely unsuccessful in their attempts to maintain Christian control over the Holy Land, had profound impacts on the societies involved. They fostered new religious and cultural interactions, facilitated political and territorial consolidation, and resulted in lasting changes in military, political, and religious structures. Moreover, these crusades contributed to the evolving idea of what constituted a crusade, a concept that became increasingly intertwined with broader patterns of conflict, conquest, and change in the medieval world. Chapter 9 – The Impact and Legacy of the Crusades The legacy of the Crusades, a series of religiously inspired military campaigns spanning over two centuries, has left indelible marks on both Western and Middle Eastern societies. These campaigns, characterized by a complex interplay of religious fervor, socio-political dynamics, economic ambition, and cultural exchange, had far-reaching impacts that continue to resonate in contemporary discourse. Understanding this legacy requires an exploration of the profound and diverse effects the Crusades had on religious communities, socio-political structures, economic systems, and cultural and intellectual developments in Europe, the Middle East, and beyond. On a broad socio-political level, the Crusades played a significant role in shaping the medieval societies of both Europe and the Middle East. In Europe, they contributed to the consolidation of papal power and the spread of Christian orthodoxy, although they also sowed seeds of dissent and discord that would contribute to later religious conflicts. They bolstered the notion of a unified Christendom standing against a perceived Muslim threat, a sentiment that found expression in the creation of military religious orders such as the Knights Templar and the Hospitallers. For the Middle East, the Crusades led to significant upheavals. The establishment of the Crusader states disrupted existing political entities and stimulated a process of unification among Muslim territories. The Muslim victories, particularly under the leadership of figures like Saladin, were instrumental in fostering a sense of Islamic unity and resurgence. Economically, the Crusades brought about notable shifts. In Europe, they stimulated the growth of a money economy as Crusaders needed to finance their expeditions. This led to the rise of new financial institutions and practices, such as banking and lending systems, which laid the groundwork for the commercial revolution in the late Middle Ages. The Crusades also facilitated the exchange of Eastern and Western goods, leading to an increased demand for Eastern products in Europe and promoting the development of trade routes and networks across the Mediterranean. In terms of cultural and intellectual impacts, the Crusades were a catalyst for the transmission of knowledge, ideas, and cultural practices between East and West. The Crusaders' contact with the more scientifically and culturally advanced Islamic world led to the diffusion of a wide range of knowledge in fields such as medicine, astronomy, mathematics, and philosophy into Europe. This transmission played a significant role in sparking the intellectual revitalization that characterized the Renaissance. Moreover, the Crusades had a profound influence on literature and art. They inspired a wide range of literary works, from histories and chronicles to romances and epic poetry, which shaped the medieval European literary canon and contributed to the development of national literatures. In art, they influenced the Western European artistic vocabulary through the introduction of Byzantine and Islamic motifs and techniques. On the darker side, the Crusades also fostered a legacy of religious intolerance, violence, and conflict. They set a precedent for religiously sanctioned violence and the concept of holy war in both Christian and Muslim traditions. They also exacerbated Christian-Muslim antagonism and fostered stereotypes and prejudices that have persisted into the modern era. 
Chapter 10, Conclusion The Crusades, spanning over two centuries from the late 11th to the late 13th century, represent a seminal period in world history. They were not simply a sequence of religious wars, as traditionally portrayed, but a complex phenomenon that influenced a range of social, political, economic, and cultural aspects of both Western and Middle Eastern societies. To grasp the full significance of the Crusades, it is essential to view them as both a product of, and a catalyst for, broader historical processes and transformations. Religiously, the Crusades were born out of the fusion of Christian piety, reform movements within the Church, and the concept of holy war. They represented an attempt to mobilize Christian society for a common cause, to defend Christendom and regain the Holy Land, perceived to be under threat from Muslim expansion. Yet, as the chapters of this study demonstrate, the religious goals were intertwined with socio-political and economic objectives. The role of religious fervor cannot be disentangled from the ambitions of secular and ecclesiastical elites, the dynamics of feudal society, and the lure of economic gains. Politically, the Crusades had profound implications. In the West, they contributed to the expansion of papal power, the development of new forms of military organization and chivalric ethos, and the assertion of a collective Christian identity. In the East, they disrupted existing political structures, provoked the unification of Muslim powers, and shaped the trajectories of states and societies in the region. Yet, these political transformations were not merely the outcomes of the Crusades but also part of the reasons they were launched and sustained. Economically, the Crusades were both driven by and resulted in substantial changes. The need to finance the Crusades stimulated developments in Western European economies, contributing to the rise of commercial and financial practices that paved the way for the late medieval economic expansion. At the same time, the Crusades opened up new avenues for cultural and commercial exchange between the East and West, fostering a more interconnected and globalized medieval world. Culturally and intellectually, the Crusades had a profound and lasting impact. The encounter with the Islamic world, with its rich philosophical and scientific tradition, played a significant role in catalyzing intellectual and cultural revitalization in Europe. The Crusades left an indelible mark on literature, art, and collective memory shaping identities and narratives that continue to resonate in contemporary societies. Yet, as we reflect on the legacy of the Crusades, it is crucial to acknowledge their darker aspects. They fostered a legacy of violence, religious intolerance, and conflict that has left deep scars on Christian-Muslim relations. The Crusades, for all their complexity and historical significance, also symbolized the capacity for religion to be harnessed for destructive ends, a sobering reminder of the potential perils of religious fervor. In conclusion, understanding the Crusades and all their complexity offers valuable insights into the medieval world and the enduring dynamics of religion, power, and intercultural interaction. They remind us that history is not a simple narrative of events, but a complex tapestry woven from the threads of human ambition, belief, and interaction. The study of the Crusades provides a lens through which to view the complexities of this tapestry, offering timeless lessons about the human condition and the intricate interplay of faith, power, and culture that continues to shape our world. More information and facts. Part 1, Individual Perspectives and Experiences in the Crusades Though the historical narrative often paints the Crusades as a grand geopolitical and religious saga, understanding them from the perspectives of individuals provides a nuanced perspective on these events. The experiences of knights, priests, common soldiers, civilians, women, and even children can paint a more complex picture of the human realities that underpin the grandeur of the Crusades. Knights, the knightly class was central to the Crusades. Noble-born warriors, often motivated by a mixture of religious devotion, a sense of adventure, and the promise of land and wealth, were the backbone of the Crusader forces. For these men, the Crusades offered an opportunity to exhibit their martial prowess and reaffirm their status within feudal society. However, their experiences varied greatly. Many would have found the journey to the Holy Land arduous, fraught with perils from disease, starvation, and combat. Yet, for those who survived and achieved distinction, the Crusades could prove immensely rewarding, resulting in wealth, land, and enhanced prestige. Priests, the clergy played crucial roles in the Crusades, from inspiring and sanctioning the campaigns to accompanying the Crusaders as spiritual guides and chaplains. 
Their motivations ranged from deep-seated religious conviction to the pursuit of ecclesiastical power. They were responsible for maintaining the morale and spiritual health of the Crusader armies, often a challenging task given the harsh realities of the campaigns. The writings of these priests provide invaluable insights into the motivations and experiences of the Crusaders. Common soldiers, while the knightly elite often dominate the narratives, common soldiers, including infantry and archers, were crucial to the Crusades. These men, often drawn from the lower strata of society, were motivated by a variety of factors, religious fervor, the prospect of economic gain, a desire for adventure, or simply the pressure of societal expectations. Their experiences were likely harsh, facing the brunt of combat, disease, and the hardships of long marches and sieges. Civilians, the impact of the Crusades on civilians, both in Europe and the Middle East, was significant. In the West, the departure of men for the Crusades had profound effects on families and local communities. Women often had to assume increased responsibilities, managing estates and families in the absence of their husbands or fathers. In the East, civilians bore the brunt of warfare, with cities besieged and often sacked, populations massacred or displaced, and local economies disrupted. Yet, the establishment of the Crusader states also facilitated increased interactions between Western settlers and local populations, fostering unique hybrid cultures. Women, while traditionally overlooked, women's experiences during the Crusades are a crucial aspect of understanding these events. Women in the West, as mentioned above, often had to manage family estates in the absence of male relatives. Some noble women even went on crusade themselves, such as Eleanor of Aquitaine. In the East, women both Muslim and Christian, often found themselves at the mercy of the invading armies, with numerous accounts of violence and exploitation. However, there are also stories of resilience and agency, with women playing crucial roles in diplomacy, defense, and cultural interaction within the Crusader states. Children, the experiences of children during the Crusades, while not extensively documented, were undoubtedly significant. The most notable instance is the so-called Children's Crusade in 1212, which, despite its name, was not an actual crusade but a popular movement involving people of all ages. Many children were also affected by the absence of fathers who left for the Crusades, while in the East, they were victims of the warfare and disruptions caused by the Crusader invasions. By exploring these individual perspectives, we can gain a deeper and more nuanced understanding of the Crusades, not just as grand geopolitical and religious events, but as profoundly human experiences, fraught with all the complexities, contradictions, and tragedies that define the human condition. Part 2, Comparative Study, The Northern Crusades To widen our perspective and gain a comprehensive understanding of the crusading phenomena, it's instrumental to examine the Northern Crusades. These were a series of religious wars in the Baltic region from the late 12th to the early 13th century, primarily against the pagans in what are now Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. The Northern Crusades share commonalities with their counterparts in the Middle East. Like the Middle Eastern Crusades, they were blessed by the Pope and involved a fusion of religious fervor, political ambition, and economic motivations. In both cases, the Crusades also served as a catalyst for the spread of Western Christianity and cultural, economic, and political changes in the regions they affected. However, significant differences emerge upon closer examination. The Northern Crusades were directed against pagan, rather than Muslim, opponents. They were not aimed at retaking holy places, as in the Middle East, but rather at converting the Baltic peoples to Christianity and integrating their territories into the Latin Christian world. The primary actors in the Northern Crusades were not the knights from the heart of Europe, but rather the Teutonic Knights and other military orders, as well as the Kingdom of Denmark and the Swedish nobility. In terms of impact, the Northern Crusades fundamentally reshaped the Baltic region. The crusading efforts led to the eventual Christianization of the Baltic tribes and their integration into the Latin Christian world. The formation of new political entities, such as the Teutonic Order State and the Archbishopric of Riga, introduced feudal structures and Latin Christian ecclesiastical institutions. The cities established by the Crusaders, like Riga and Königsberg, became hubs for trade and cultural exchange between the Baltic region and the rest of Europe. The violence and coercion involved in the Christianization process also resulted in resistance, resulting in centuries of conflict. The legacy of the Northern Crusades has had a lasting impact on the Baltic region's socio-political and religious landscape, contributing to the formation of modern national identities in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Part 3, The Jewish Perspective, Persecution During the Crusades 
The Crusades, while primarily directed against Muslims in the Middle East and pagans in Northern Europe, also led to horrific outbreaks of violence against Jewish communities in Europe, particularly within the region known as the Rhineland. This experience had a profound impact on Jewish society and culture, shaping communal memory, legal and ethical deliberation, and literary expression. The onset of the First Crusade in 1096 marked a disastrous turning point in the history of Jewish-Christian relations in Europe. As bands of knights and peasants mustered for the long journey to the Holy Land, anti-Jewish fervor surged, fueled by a toxic mix of religious fanaticism, economic resentment, and societal unrest. Crusaders, stirred by preaching that framed the Crusades as a battle against Christ's enemies, often asked, why travel thousands of miles to fight the infidel when they resided among them? This rhetorical question turned into brutal reality during the Rhineland massacres, where Jewish communities in cities like Worms, Mainz, and Cologne faced horrific violence. Many Jews were slaughtered, forcibly baptized, or chose martyrdom, known as Kiddush Hashem, the sanctification of God's name through death, rather than convert to Christianity. These pogroms marked the first major wave of anti-Jewish violence in Europe tied to the crusading movement, but it would not be the last. Later crusades also led to outbreaks of violence against Jews, such as the Shepherd's Crusade in 1320 and the massacres associated with the Black Death in the mid-14th century. These events had a profound impact on Jewish communities. They were a demographic disaster, wiping out significant parts of the Ashkenazi Jewish population. They also caused a significant shift in Jewish life, with many Jewish communities gradually moving eastwards, away from the violent upheavals of Western Europe towards relative safety in Poland and Lithuania. On a cultural level, these events seared themselves into the Jewish communal memory, influencing religious and philosophical literature, liturgy, and legal rulings. The narratives of the Jewish martyrs during the First Crusade, known as the Chronicles of Martyrdom and Destruction, Hebrew, Gezero Tatnu, became integral parts of Jewish historiography. They are commemorated through liturgical poems, Slihot and Kinnet, and Fast Days. The anti-Jewish violence of the Crusades also forced Jewish religious authorities to confront challenging legal and ethical questions about martyrdom, suicide, and the sanctity of life, leaving an indelible mark on Jewish legal and ethical discourse. Part 4, Art, Literature, and Culture, The Cultural Legacy of the Crusades The Crusades had an indelible influence on the cultural development of both the West and the East, leaving their imprint on art, architecture, music, and literature. This cultural exchange led to a diffusion of ideas and aesthetics, which expanded horizons and reshaped societies. In the realm of art and architecture, the Crusaders' exposure to the highly developed traditions of Byzantine and Islamic art had a transformative effect. The Crusader states, notably Antioch, Jerusalem, and later Cyprus, became crucibles of cross-cultural interaction, synthesizing elements from Latin, Byzantine, and Islamic art into a unique aesthetic. For instance, the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, reconstructed during the Crusader era, shows clear influences of Byzantine and Armenian styles. The diffusion of Islamic art and architecture into the West, especially the use of intricate geometric designs and the employment of horseshoe and pointed arches, also played a role in the genesis of the Romanesque and Gothic styles in Europe. The Crusades' impact was not confined to the visual arts. They also had a transformative effect on literature. Crusade narratives, whether in Latin chronicles or old French chansons de geste, proliferated, shaping the medieval understanding of history and warfare. The Crusades also intersected with the development of the Arthurian and Grail literary traditions. In works such as Wolfram von Eschenbach's Parzival, the idea of the knight as a holy warrior on a spiritual quest found its ultimate expression. Similarly, the figure of the Saracen, Muslim, knight, such as Saladin, entered Western chivalric romance, representing the noble, virtuous other. In music, the Crusades gave rise to a body of song associated with the crusading movement, such as the Song of Roland. These songs were used to stir up enthusiasm for the Crusades and chronicle the exploits of the Crusaders. On a broader level, the contact with the Middle East enriched European music with new instrument types, rhythms, and melodic structures. Moreover, the cultural influence of the Crusades had an intellectual aspect. The Crusades' contact with the Muslim world played a role in the translation movement of the 12th century, which brought Greek and Arabic philosophical and scientific texts to the Latin West. These translations, including works by Aristotle, Galen, and Avicenna, profoundly influenced scholastic philosophy and the development of universities in Europe. Part 5, Long-Term Legacy and Memory, Remembering the Crusades The Crusades have left an indelible imprint on historical memory, both in the West and in the Middle East. Over the centuries, they have been romanticized, 
demonized, interpreted, and reinterpreted to serve various socio-political, religious, and cultural narratives, demonstrating the malleability and potency of historical memory. In Western memory, the Crusades have been remembered in complex and often conflicting ways. During the Middle Ages and into the early modern period, they were generally viewed through a positive lens. The Crusaders were valorized as religious heroes embarking on a spiritual quest, an interpretation reflected in contemporaneous chronicles, chivalric romances, and the widespread popularity of Crusade indulgences. In the Romantic era, the Crusades became idealized as a heroic age of faith and chivalry, epitomized in works like Sir Walter Scott's The Talisman and reflected in the Gothic revival architecture. During the colonial era, crusading rhetoric was employed to justify Western imperial ventures, presenting them as a civilizing mission. However, in the wake of two world wars and the decolonization process, the Western perception of the Crusades began to shift. They started to be seen more critically as a destructive, aggressive, and intolerant phenomenon, a perspective popularized in works like Stephen Runciman's History of the Crusades. In the Middle East, the memory of the Crusades also evolved over time. Unlike in the West, the Crusades did not play a significant role in Muslim historical consciousness until the modern era. Medieval Muslim historians did not view the Crusades as a unified movement but as a series of disconnected Frankish invasions. For much of the Ottoman era, the Crusades were largely forgotten. It was only in the 19th and 20th centuries, under the impact of Western imperialism and Arab nationalism, that the Crusades were reinterpreted as a seminal clash of civilizations. This narrative, often infused with religious and anti-colonial sentiment, found its way into popular culture, school textbooks, and political rhetoric. In recent times, the Crusades have been invoked in the context of global politics. They have been misused by extremist groups, both in the West and the Middle East, to justify acts of violence, highlighting the dangerous potential of historical memory when it is divorced from historical context and complexity. Part 6. Health and Medicine – Medical Legacy of the Crusades the Crusades, characterized by extensive contact and exchange between cultures, provided a conduit for the transmission of medical knowledge from the Muslim world to Western Europe, triggering profound changes in the understanding and practice of medicine. During the medieval period, the Arab world was a thriving center for medical knowledge and practice. Scholars in places like Baghdad, Damascus, and Cordoba built on the foundations of Greek and Persian medicine, made significant advancements, and amassed extensive medical literature. However, prior to the Crusades, much of this knowledge remained inaccessible to Western Europe, which had lost connection with the Hellenistic medical tradition following the fall of the Roman Empire. The establishment of Crusader states in the Middle East, and the close contact between Crusaders and local populations, led to an increased exposure to Arab medicine. Crusader hospitals, notably the Order of St. John in Jerusalem, known for their care for the sick and wounded, became important centers for this medical exchange. Here, Western practitioners encountered advanced techniques in surgery, hygiene, and the treatment of wounds, such as the Arab practice of stitching wounds with silk and using antiseptics like alcohol. They also became acquainted with the Arab tradition of hospital organization and medical education. However, the most lasting impact of the Crusades on Western medicine came from the translation of Arabic medical texts into Latin. Crusaders brought back numerous manuscripts on medicine, which found their way into monastic libraries. These included the works of renowned scholars like Ibn Sina, Avicenna, Al-Razi, Razas, and Ibn Rushd, Averroes. Translated mostly in centers like Toledo in Spain and Sicily, which had close contact with the Arab world, these texts provided a gateway to a wealth of medical knowledge. The Canon of Medicine by Avicenna, for example, became a standard medical textbook in medieval European universities. It introduced Western practitioners to systematic observation, clinical trials, and the understanding of diseases in terms of contagious nature and environmental factors, representing a significant leap forward from the humor-based approach of Galenique medicine. In the wake of the Crusades, the practice of medicine in Western Europe began to transform. Hospitals began to multiply, inspired by the Arab model. Universities started teaching Arab medicine, and surgery began to develop as a distinct discipline. The medical renaissance of the 12th century, sparked by the translations of Arabic medical texts, laid the groundwork for the later developments in medicine during the Renaissance and Enlightenment. Part 7, Technology and Military Tactics, The Crusades as a Crucible of War The Crusades were not only religious campaigns but also major military expeditions. They brought together armies from disparate regions, pitting Western European knights against Middle Eastern warriors in a conflict that spanned more than two centuries. The varied terrains, 
from the fortified cities of the Levant to the open plains of Anatolia, and the clash of different military cultures, led to significant advancements and exchanges in military technology and tactics. Western European armies, prior to the Crusades, had been characterized by heavy cavalry, knights in armor wielding lances. This form of warfare, suited to the open fields of Europe, ran into difficulties in the Middle East, where the landscape was varied and where local forces, particularly the Turkish forces, utilized more mobile forms of warfare, including the extensive use of horse archers. The experiences in the Holy Land, consequently, led to adaptations and innovations. For instance, the Hospitallers and Templars, two prominent military monastic orders, combined Western heavy cavalry tactics with aspects of local military practices to create a uniquely effective fighting force. In terms of military technology, the Crusades saw several key developments. Perhaps the most significant was in the field of fortification. The Crusaders, upon capturing territory, were often required to hold and defend cities and castles against counterattacks. The need for effective fortifications led to a rapid development in castle design and construction, with many Crusader castles featuring both Byzantine and Islamic influences, in addition to traditional Western designs. Castles such as Croc de Chevalier in Syria represented the pinnacle of contemporary fortification techniques. Similarly, siege warfare saw notable improvements during the Crusades. The need to capture well-fortified cities led the Crusaders to adopt and refine various siege technologies. This included the use of siege towers, battering rams, and a variety of catapults, such as mangonels and trebuchets. Notably, the Crusaders often learned from their Muslim opponents, who were skilled in the use of counter-siege techniques. On the other side, the Muslim forces also adapted in response to the Crusades. Facing the heavily armored knights, they developed tactics to counter this threat, such as the use of massed archery and feigned retreats. The Mamluks, in particular, developed an effective system of heavy cavalry that could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Crusader knights. In conclusion, the Crusades, in their role as a prolonged period of conflict and contact between different military cultures, spurred significant advancements and exchanges in military technology and tactics. The legacy of these developments persisted long after the end of the Crusades themselves, influencing the course of military history in both the East and the West. Thanks for watching to the end. See you in new videos.